So Sarah is among design's foremost critical thinkers and educators. I consider her an activist, a kind of moral compass for the discipline. Uh, she's acutely sensitive and in opposition to the ways design is complicit, whether consciously or not, in maintaining hegemonic systems of control, of promoting and communicating ideas and ideals that are not commensurate with many of our own. Her great engagement for education, but also in public discussions, opens a space for critical thinking, which allows us to see design beyond just shiny surfaces. I was immediately impressed by Sarah's commitment and innovative ways of thinking. As someone with a background in design, she found ways to introduce exploratory methods to historical research and writing and to push the boundaries. Hi everybody, my name is Vera Sacchetti and I am very excited to be talking today to Sarah Owens, who is one of the recipients of the Swiss Grand Award for Design 2021. Times are tough and we cannot meet in person, Sarah, but I am delighted to be having the opportunity to talk to you in this digital format. Welcome, and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. How are you today? I'm fine, and thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure. Well, it's my pleasure. I can tell that for sure. Sarah, I wanted to talk to you to start the conversation by introducing you a little bit to our uh, viewers. Um, you are a design educator with a very international background and outlook. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your uh, path until you arrived to the present moment um, in which you are uh, currently based in Zurich and you are teaching since a decade at the Zurich University of the Arts, where you lead the uh, visual communication department. Sure. Um, well, I studied communication design in Germany and I worked as an editorial and corporate designer for a while. And design education was not on my horizon at that moment. Um, at one point um, when I had started, there was a big financial crisis that was due to the dot-com bubble bursting. People had invested too much into internet companies. So I was hopping from one publishing house to the next, from one studio to the next. And I thought since I had always wanted to do graduate studies, this would be a great time to pursue that. I applied at the Royal College of Art to study history of design uh, and the V&A uh, in London. So I got in and that was the point really when I was studying and hearing um, all about how design can be viewed, how design has been viewed in history, was really about um, coming to see design as a cultural expression. And um, I started to read into sociology, I started to read into cultural theory, and that kind of expanded my uh, idea of what design was, and that was really what I was aiming for with the graduate studies, to figure out, like, what am I doing here every day? Like, why do designers do the stuff that they do, and why are they educated in the way that they're educated? And then the next part, the next step, was um, I guess the doctoral studies that was kind of self-evident because I at the time did not want to return to uh, practicing design. I thought okay doctoral studies will be th the way to go forward to you know understand much more about the design profession and then when I had um, gone into the studying for the PhD for a while I decided to say, okay, maybe academia is the right way to go. I applied for jobs. And then going into the de design education was really nice because it um, allowed me to bridge theory and practice and history 
Um, it really allowed me to connect design to other disciplines, to talk with young designers about the role of design and what they want to change. Um, so it was a nice environment for me to bring or contribute all the things that I had accumulated over the years. Um, so it sounds very straightforward, um, but design education was not a career goal for me from the start. It was more like one thing led to the other, and I was always just interested and really curious about certain things. Well, your work in Zurich has certainly been visionary, um, and in part, this is also what this award celebrates. Um, you've been conducting, um, you know, the work of a design educator is not an easy work, not at all, and I'm sure you will agree. Um, but the work that you've been doing at the ZHDK is a work that is fundamentally breaking barriers, not only between this idea that design academia is an ivory tower, but also uh, in trying to reach out and mentor students to understand design as a discipline that can be fundamentally more powerful than what the canon has defined for this discipline in the 20th century. Um, you've been there now for a decade, you've had different roles in the department, um, and you had the MA in visual communication. You also had the um, visual research unit, which is also speaking a lot about your interest in design research. Um, I was wondering if we could go back a little bit to your path. And despite the fact that you just yourself said that it was not a linear path, it is somehow uh, peppered here and there with very interesting turning points. And I was thinking we could maybe talk, um, first of all, about your um, fellowship at the Académie Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart, which took place in 2009. And for you, it was also a way to make space for a variety of ideas that you were already thinking about, right? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right, uh, in 2009, um, and it was really a moment uh, where I had just finished writing a book. Um, I was kind of two years into my PhD. I was just busy with a lot of stuff. And um, Solitude was a really welcome disruption. It was um, amazing in the sense that there was no necessity to produce anything. Um, so I just had all this free time in which I could read um, into philosophy or anthropology, I could talk with all these other amazing people from, the fi from fine arts, from architecture, musicians were there, composers, dancers, and so on. So in that sense, it was really like a, a space to breathe and to think. Um, and coming out of a cycle where I kept like going from one deadline to the next, trying to find my way, as an academic um, and suddenly having all of this freedom to just let ideas emerge was really, really nice. Um, what really also crystallized for me was that I came from a very disciplinary perspective. So I was looking at design as a designer. That's how I was trained. Um, I had studied design history, so of course, I stayed within the design discourse. And this um, fellowship really opened up that again. And I had the feeling that there are a lot of disciplines or fields that talk about design, but they don't necessarily frame it that way. So um, finally, um, together with Björn Franke, I organized a symposium there two years later. And we said, okay, let's look at design as a fundamental human activity. And um, let's just take a very interdisciplinary approach in inviting all these people from different fields um, to talk about design, to talk about how we design ourselves and to enrich the design history at the time, which again was kind of coming very much from the inside, coming very much from this is design and we don't want to make other connections. So that was really an aim that I had um, to make these connections between the fields, to open up and to take a more broad perspective. Yeah. 
certainly these are things that then influence your design and education practice afterwards. I really find it very interesting, this idea of lack of outcomes and this idea that you are not sort of burdened by this constant pressure of academia, of, of, of but also of design itself to constantly produce, to constantly, you know, deadline after deadline after deadline, put something out into the world. The fact that you were able to have this sort of like open space for you to sort of allow new ideas to emerge and that these ideas emerged in an interdisciplinary context. I find these are important clues for the work that then you will be doing later um, in your career. And of course, I am sure that that experience influenced a lot your PhD research. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that understanding and also the understanding that you previously mentioned that connects to the social sciences, how that all kind of came together in your PhD research. Sure. Um, so I did my uh, PhD at the University of Reading and I came with a topic that was actually came out of my MA thesis. Um, I was very interested in what professional designers would call amateur design. Um, so the kind of design, maybe the PowerPoint presentations, websites, notices and so on that um, designers who are not formally trained as designers make or produce. So um, I was really interested in figuring out how do everyday designers understand what they do? How do they make sense of a design task? Uh, what knowledge are their decisions based on? Like you say, the defining moment was when I connected to the social sciences, when I went more deeply into sociology and ethnography and really said, OK, I'm looking at graphic design, but I'm not looking at it as, you know, like an in an aesthetic way or so. I'm looking at it as social practice. And that was really important because when I was speaking to the everyday designers, I interviewed a few and also worked with them. Um, I had to find new ways in a way to speak with them about design. I could not uh, rely on the professional discourse that I was taught or, I mean, we, we wouldn't talk about micro typography or ligatures or anything like that because other things were important to their way of designing. Um, so I really, for me, it was very important that I had a, a, a tools or possibilities to speak with them and also to learn from them. And the social sciences gave me those tools through ethnography, through interviews and so on. It really got me to take a new perspective because I was also used to kind of say, oh, you know, you can just dismiss that kind of design because you're kind of being taught that that's what professional designers distance themselves from. But on the other hand, everyday design makes up a large part of our visual culture. So it's there, it's, it surrounds us and so on. So um, when I'm going through this process, I kind of had to learn, unlearn, let's say unlearn my own design education. I had to find new ways of framing the process or thinking about what's important here that was not the same as, as I had been taught. And I think the big question came up when I uh, came to the point where I was asking, okay, but who is actually defining these everyday designers as amateurs? Who is defining them as you know, people who don't know what they're doing? Who is drawing these boundaries? So I had to look at those who were doing that, which were the professional designers, me included. And then I had to more closely look at this relation between professional and everyday designers. And I was really struck by the, the recognition that when we as professional designers define, in, in a sense, the outsiders, uh, we also define ourselves. So if, um, for example, professional designers say that everyday designers 
design unconsciously or um, that they only decide according to personal preferences. That means that um, in turn, professional designers design consciously and decide according to other kinds of criteria. So it was a, it was a kind of self-definition. Um, I was looking at how professional designers think about themselves and it was not so much um, going into whether this is true or not. I was looking at that as well, but it was really more about how is this boundary being established. And then me kind of retreating from the professional side and saying, I'm just observing this or trying to see this relation and not taking sides anymore. Um, so that was really, um, I think, due to those uh, social science methods that I was, uh, was using. And they also transformed me in the process. I felt I was a completely different person with a very different perspective after having done this research than before. before. I mean, I'm sure this also influenced many of the things that you did after, but just this understanding of these exclusionary methods, right? Which the discipline and by, by definition, then all of those who practice the discipline implement in the practice of the discipline, in the education of the discipline, really helps or, or hinders the progress of the discipline because we are fundamentally creating more silos. So not only we already create disciplinary silos with design education, we are also creating very strong boundaries um, that define who is allowed in and who is not allowed in. And of course, this creates not only a hierarchy and issues of value because then your work as a professional designer is of course valued more paid more than the work of an amateur or an everyday designer as you mentioned but also it talks about certain a certain elitism which we still see very presently in the design disciplines which is fundamentally a hindrance to the progression and evolution, natural evolution of the discipline. Um, I wanted to talk about one of the first research projects that you were involved in, more um, not as a lead researcher, but as a co-researcher. This took place in 2014, 2015, and it was called Art School Differences. And this also investigated, in a way, the methods by which institutions exclude and include certain voices. So could you tell us a little bit about Art School Differences? Yes, um, sure. So yes, it was research that was initiated by several researchers in different art schools. And I was a co-researcher um, and I had the freedom to define a project within that uh, thematic scope. And I chose to look at design education or specifically graphic design education. And um, what I tried to do is, is pick a maybe a phrase or a concept that would enable me to look at mechanisms of inclusion and inclusion specifically as I have um, experienced them in design education, um, in my own design education, but also how I see or observe them or experience them in uh, the teaching that, that we do. So I took this phrase that I hear quite often, which is good design or the good designer. Um, and this phrase has a normative quality. Um, good is, of course, something that is morally good. It's something that, um, that I mean, proposes uh, some ideas about who designers are or what they do or who can become a designer as well. So these are all um, normative narratives that are encapsulated in this kind of phrase. Um, so it really got me into thinking more about these kind of narratives, maybe also myths, that shape or normalize certain attitudes or values or beliefs that we might have about design, both students and educators. Uh, and also practitioners. So if we have a certain attitude 
uh, towards good design or who a good designer is or what they do, that brings with it certain protocols that influence how we select people, that influence how we define excellence, um, that influence who gets to graduate. Um, and, and really these assumptions are made and sometimes they really disconnect to what the actual situations of students are. If the good designer is a person who um, works all day and night, then that becomes a normative narrative and um, all the designers who have family responsibilities, all of those who have like a non-traditional path coming into design, they might not, or, you know, who, who have other, you know, responsibilities that, um, that, that might impact on their practice, they cannot become good designers. So in that sense, it was also, again, this question about who gets to be a designer and why, who draws the boundaries, who makes the definitions. And at this point, what was really nice is that we were encouraged not to stay with the analysis, but look for those situations or uh, possibilities of change to really say, okay, I can identify the admissions process as a point where I can change something and then also kind of go towards, okay, um, figuring out how we counteract some of these mechanisms that we observed. And did the outcomes of this research process um, have a certain impact? I mean, surely they had an impact in how you consider issues of admissions, who gets to get in, who doesn't get to be admitted. Um, I can imagine it changed things in your practice. Did it change also things um, in the institutions where you operate? Well, that's um, a good question. It's, it's mainly that you know, these kind of changes are very small. They're not changes that are you know, bold or can be proclaimed. I do think I can observe them in the sense that we have more diverse, a more diverse student body, for instance, that we allow for more flexibility within the curriculum, um, that also the conversations that we have across institutions go into different ways where these topics of who is inside and who is outside come more to the fore. Our idea about that a uh, typical graphic designer is a very homogenous picture of, of you know, a, a certain type of person, maybe we can change that kind of picture um, because we uh, want to go into di a different direction. We want to include more perspectives. We want to include more diverse experiences as well. And in that way, I think the, the change is no, not measurable, but there's a, a vibe or an attitude that I think signals that these things are going into a different and better direction. Yeah. That is um, an interesting conversation that I would like to continue further down the line in our talk today, Sarah. But before we get there, I wanted to also talk about um, another side of your career, which has been developing steadily over the course of the last years, which is this um, idea of activism as something that has to happen parallel to your work as a design educator. So you are active within academia, you are active within design education. And as we were just talking about, these are sort of fields that can de be deemed exclusive and exclusionary, but at the same time, there are also fields that can be deemed somewhat um, like ivory towers, inaccessible to many. And you have been working um, on a variety of fronts on getting out of this ivory tower and sort of connecting to the communities around you in a different way. One such example, which I would like to talk about is the Black Film Festival Zurich. Um, which is an initiative that you started and, and continue to be involved in. And 
I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your path to trying to connect to the communities around you in different ways. Yes, um, so the Black Film Festival is, I think, the very good example for that um, in this kind of outreach activity. Um, also that it has ma many layers for me and also for the co-organizers. So um, in 2019, we debuted the Black Film Festival Zurich. And um, we decided that we wanted to show feature length films and also short films that are either by black filmmakers or that show some aspect of black experience. And here we, we come from a side that we say on the one hand, there are certain aims that we have. We want to show films that are from around the world. So it's not just the US context. It's not just um, the African continent, but we really want to have the you know, African continent and the African diaspora uh, represented. And the other thing was that it was very important for us to have non-stereotypical narratives and representation. So these are the kind of the activist aims, but on the other hand, we're doing a film festival. So we want the films to be enjoyable. We want the films to, um, so people can come in and, and have an experience that they enjoy. And it's not so didactic in the sense of, you know, let's talk about these narratives. There is a difference for me, of course, than doing, saying like, I'm going to do a film seminar about black film and then actually doing a festival where, where we can um, pick films that are not shown anywhere else and we can make them available to, to the community. So I think the starting point for us was also that we saw that um, a lot of the films that are in cinematic history hailed as very important for black cinema, nevertheless had stereotypical um, ideas behind them. The black protagonists were poor or uneducated. Um, they needed a white savior to get them out of the poverty and so on. We didn't see enough films that show other types of uh, protagonists, of figures, of stories. Uh, we wanted to see black people in these films who are not caricatures. We want to see complex figures, of course. So um, on the one hand, when we selected these films and when we show them, it's a comment on the film industry, of course, where we say there's not enough diversity, also in not just the filmmakers and the producers and the actors and so on, but also in the types of stories that are told. And it's also a comment, of course, then on representation, on identity. But like I said, there are also films you can just simply watch and enjoy. So there are several levels of access. And for me to kind of leave the ivory tower, as you said, in that way is really nice because the conversations that I have outside of the academic environment are just different kinds of conversations and they're really enriching. So um, this, this layering of, you know, on one hand, there are certain activist aims, on the other hand, it's like a personal desire. On the next hand, it's really kind of bringing a community together um, in, in looking at the films and talking about them is what I enjoy so much about this kind of work. She's also attuned to and a tireless promoter of the emancipatory potentials of design and works tirelessly uh, to make it an inclusive discipline where historically neglected voices can thrive. Her teaching and academic leadership, her writing and her engagement with audiences of a diverse kind are exemplary. Looking at design, not just from the inside of our little happy community, but focusing on its meaning from a perspective from society and its processes allows us for a discussion on certain topics that otherwise wouldn't even arise.
I mean, what you also do is not only you are creating and making spaces that previously were not there with your with the, the activist side of your of your practice, but you are also creating spaces for conversations that didn't exist previously. And this is also uh, very parallel to the work that you uh, conduct within um, the educational institution. Um, for me, what is very interesting is this idea of making space and claiming space and also this idea of imagining otherwise because as you yourself said if you don't see certain people in certain roles all around you why would you yourself think that a person for example like you can be in those roles right so the lack of role models and the lack of representation is something that is endemic not only to our everyday life but very pointedly in design education itself. Um, and I feel like the accumulation of all these experiences that we've been discussing, you know, has brought you to the present moment in your personal uh, life, but also in your professional practice. And I was wondering if you could tell us about your, your current priorities at this moment in time. Um, I know that you have been developing a new research project and you have, um, certain research interests that you are exploring right now. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So um, the current research interests that I have at the moment, like you said, I kind of carry them with me and they just, I just try to reconfigure them in different ways. See how some questions kind of suddenly connect to others, although they were very far apart, maybe two years ago. Um, and I keep revolving around the question of representation, of visibility, of knowledge as well, of language, and um, I guess also politics. I want to see how certain visual representations produce otherness within our current media. Um, I'm really interested in kind of the unknown and the unseen, so things that remain hidden and that might want to remain hidden, um, where like a plain visibility is not always the solution. And maybe how does that connect with hyper visibility? Um, these kind of things are questions that, I don't know, they don't have to lead to a, a paper or they have, they don't have to um, be a certain product that I, that I produce. It's more that, they keep revolving around in, you know, in the teaching that I do. They pop up maybe in certain research projects that I'm involved in. Um, and they just keep on accompanying me. Um, I think what's also very important with, with these, I guess, with these questions is, again, the process of unlearning. This process that I underwent when I was doing my PhD of bracketing my knowledge, really opening up to other views. Um, I know there is a sense that when you acquire knowledge, it's very precious. Like I worked so hard to know this and to understand this, it's so hard to let it go. But not, I see unlearning not as a process of losing something. It's more kind of interrogating what you've learned and why you have learned that in order to learn something about your learning. I think it's helpful in developing another perspective on an issue or a new perspective on an issue. If I can really see where my standpoint comes from, then I can maybe more readily try to take a different standpoint or a different perspective. And this is something that I've been trying to explore with my students, with the graduate students mainly, where I say, okay, you have the skills, you come with, you know, you a, a practice as being a designer and now try to develop a new perspective on what you do or an issue that is very important to you. And um, so, when the students ask these questions, again, my questions come in, we talk about it. And in that way, the teaching and the research or the things that I'm personally interested in, but also that we 
have within the classroom or discuss within the classroom, they interconnect. We just did a seminar on affect, for example. Um, we read poetry, we looked at paintings, we looked at performance, we talked about how images affect us very personally as well. And these are the kind of conversations that are inspiring for me. I know that there are for me, I hope there are for the students as well to um, maybe figure out for themselves also what is important to me and where do I want to go or what kind of practice do I want to pursue when I graduate? No, totally. I mean, the world is changing and it's changing at an alarming speed. We're not just talking about the current moment that we're living in with, you know, the climate crisis, the current pandemic. Um, it, it, it seems certainly something that should be revised and questioned, much in this attitude that you talked about. How is it that we are educating our designers, because honestly, if you continue educating them under this kind of paradigm that was developed in the 20th century, following a model that was originally sort of crystallized by the experiments of the Bauhaus and the sort of linear narrative that came out of the retelling of that history throughout the, the, the next 50, 60 years, um, it certainly seems that that model is very um, different than the world that we're in today. And when the Bauhaus came about, the world was a very different place. Nowadays, shouldn't we adapt the way that we educate um, to the world as it stands around us? And the, the crisis, you know, you could think of a crisis as, as a great opportunity, like a certain, a certain kind of, let's say, neoliberal, capitalist thinking tends to postulate, but you can also still think of it as an opportunity in, in a less, um, in a less uh, form formatted way, but really as, as, a, as, a, as a space or, or as a pause, a limbo that is created for some significant change to happen. I mean, I would argue that design education is at a moment of deep uncertainty not just in Switzerland, but everywhere, um, especially in the Western Europe, North American regions, because those are the regions that fundamentally have implemented to a greater scale um, this idea, this, this modern idea of, of design and of design education, and that replicated ad eternum. This has also spread to other places in the world, as you know, um, because the Bauhaus model is so prevalent, right? But it seems to me that at least in, in the Western Europe, North American regions, this is sort of proudly people hold on to this, you know, and what is the consequence of rethinking such a model? And wouldn't it be a great advantage for all of us to fundamentally question it, to position ourselves in relation to it and to then maybe together think through it to come up with something else. I completely agree. I mean, the old formulas that we had do not work. The old, the way that people were educated, that I was educated, I also see that it would not work because these problems are so highly complex or maybe they were complex before, but we didn't realize it. We thought, you know, a poster could solve poverty um, and now we're noticing, oh, well, actually, maybe, you know, some people noticed the poster, but that actually didn't solve this very, very highly complex pro uh, problem that has a lot of stakeholders with very different interests in it. Um, so in a sense, I think that um, this pandemic, if you say, yes, it's an opportunity at least to rethink and also to interrogate uh, what we've been doing, we're forced to do that. We're forced to really rethink our relations. Uh, we're forced to rethink our values and what we hope for. We also have to rethink what we consider as truth or what we really believe in. Um, so that, in a sense, it's good that we are, that we cannot just continue in our, you know, routine way of, this is the way that design is taught. taught. Um, 
there's a universal way to design. If you just learn to deal with shapes and colors and fonts, you will do great design. I mean, we can leave that really behind us because we know it doesn't work. There is something that we need to really add and the students are bringing that. They are the ones where I can feel that in these times of uncertainty and these times of where you notice how difficult it is to deal with um, not knowing what's going to happen after this, not knowing uh, where you're going to end up uh, uh, or how design is going to change exactly and what that means for you personally, if you're going to have a job and so on. That means that design educators, of course, they have to react to this. And in that sense, what we can do, I hope at least, or what I try is to make that into a topic and say, let's try to deal with the unknown. Let's try to just bear the deep insecurity that brings that this brings with it. If we take maybe a more research oriented approach, a more inquiring approach, maybe we can say, okay, I don't see the exact final product in front of me, but I can see the next step. And I'm also open to diversions. I'm open to unexpected things that might actually lead me somewhere else. So I'm hoping that in this sense, students, when they approach design in a way that is not within this universalist kind of or very pres prescriptive manner, where they have more the freedom to attend to the actual phenomenon, where they have the freedom to say, I don't know, I don't know what's going to come out of this. Um, where they have the freedom to say, well, at least I found out that this doesn't work, that this will equip them, hopefully, with the possibility to just uh, be able to also deal with um, this uncertainty without becoming completely unable to do anything, right? Because that is the risk, that you are just so disconcerted that you cannot do anything anymore or so hopeless that you say, okay, all of this is not worth anything anymore. Of course we don't, uh, or I don't want that to happen. I mean, certainly something that you were just talking about is also this idea that, um, you know, if we continue to teach design in this idea of um, problem solving, solution oriented practice, here's your problem, here's your solution. We're of course not gonna get out of that. And, and students will feel paralyzed because they cannot come up, come up with a solution to this problem. But if we were to expand the understanding of what it is that we need to do as one that is much more related to listening, mediating, figuring out, can we actually bring something into this conversation? And this ties back to what we were talking about, about the way in which you yourself learned how to listen, to have different kinds of conversations. And that is informed by your work um, with the communities around you outside of academia, your knowledge of the social sciences and the tools of the social sciences, and also this general curiosity for interdisciplinarity and for just sharing and finding overlaps and interesting potentials for collaboration. Maybe that could be a way out of this sort of solution-driven design education that, um, that we find ourselves in nowadays. What do you think of this sort of paradigm change and, and how, perhaps as a concluding thought, um, which ideas could we hold on to, to believe that this too will be something that we can make happen? I think that um, to approach design in, in new ways or the design process in new ways, maybe more exploratively, maybe in a more open-ended way and so on, at least it uh, gives the possibility to, um, to say, okay, let's also rethink this whole thing. Let's um, rethink criteria that we have. Um, let's... Let's have this paradigm change, but 
um, be aware of, of what we want, of course. So it's not in the sense that um, we would like to destroy something or lose something. It's more really this reimagining and this rebuilding. I, I have the feeling that going away from this universalism and just being very more aware of the complexity and the kind of the multi-layeredness of experiences is already a good starting point. I think it's a good starting point to um, see how we construct and navigate, make sense of the world based on very different conditions that we find um, or that we were born into. Um, and also, I think it's very important to remain attentive to the blind spots so that we don't just say, OK, let's just do everything new, but also say, OK, what are we missing at the moment? Where are we biased in that sense? So I think it's a it's a it's a risky undertaking. It's a, almost like an upheaval. Uh, it, it also cannot be done superficially. And I think that there are more and more people who are um, just really up for trying something new in order to address these problems. Otherwise, I think we as designers make ourselves irrelevant. If we just talk about, you know, form and color and so on, and we cannot connect to other conversations and cannot express what we can bring to these problems in the sense of making something experienceable, for example, or in the sense of coming up with new perspectives. I've been trying to find like new words to, to describe this, this full investment in, with an issue. I think that students nowadays are very, very happy to kind of just dive into something completely, to be almost also be overwhelmed by something. And that needs a certain level of trust, um, a certain level of compassion, like you said, a certain level of where they develop their listening and their observation, um, where, where they also change themselves. And if, if we have um, design students who want to approach the world in these ways, then we have future designers who will also change design practice in those ways. Maybe we won't be focused so much on products, but more on asking questions. And um, there's a, a new discourse that will develop out of this. For me, I think I'm, what I'm trying to do all the time is kind of make the boundaries of design more porous. I don't want to be hermetically sealed off from other things. I want there to be a flow and I want um, things to adapt and not be so rigid. Um, I guess that's what I'm working towards. I find that to be not only an ambitious, but a very laudable goal. I wish more practitioners were doing the same than you are doing, Sarah. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you today. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for the wonderful ideas you've shared. Um, thank yes. you so much, too. I, I hope, really enjoyed it. I hope that everybody who listens to this conversation comes out of it as strengthened and inspired as I am coming out of it. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.